Hi, this is Derek C. Moss, Professor of English and Interdisciplinary Studies at SUNY Potsdam. Welcome to A Deeper Dive into African American Literature, a daily series of short podcasts produced in conjunction with SUNY Potsdam's Celebration of Black History Month in 2021. Each day this February, we'll be looking at and listening to the work of an African American writer whose name may not be as familiar as Frederick Douglass, Zora Neale Hurston, Langston Hughes, or Toni Morrison. But these writers' contributions help give us a much fuller picture of Black artists' roles in shaping American culture. Episode 18, Percival Everett. Percival Everett may be one of the most prolific living authors that most readers have never heard of. Some of the reasons for that are by Everett's own design as he's chosen to publish most of his 30-plus books to date with small independent publishers who allow him the unfettered creative control that he insists upon in his highly unconventional body of work. Everett grew up in South Carolina, but soon left it behind to live in the American West, where a sizable portion of his fiction is set. Trying to find a common theme among the massive number of books of fiction and poetry that he has published is nearly impossible, partly because Everett seems to intentionally avoid repeating himself from one book to the next. He's written novels about an aging baseball player with fading skills, about a black rancher in Wyoming, about a college professor whose corpse is mysteriously reanimated after a seemingly fatal car accident, about a young man with the curious name of not Sidney Poitier, about the god Dionysus, about a four-year-old with an IQ over 400, and about a small town sheriff investigating strange crime in rural New Mexico. In this excerpt from the opening section of Everett's best-known novel, Erasure, he introduces the novel's narrator and main character, a frustrated novelist who has struggled throughout his career with the expectations that others place on him and his writing because of his race. My name is Thelonious Ellison, and I am a writer of fiction. I have dark brown skin, curly hair, a broad nose. Some of my ancestors were slaves, and I have been detained by pasty white policemen in New Hampshire, Arizona, and Georgia. And so the society in which I live tells me I am black. That is my race. Though I'm fairly athletic, I'm no good at basketball. I listen to Mahler, Aretha Franklin, Charlie Parker, and Rye Cooter on vinyl records and compact discs. I graduated summa cum laude from Harvard, hating every minute of it. I'm good at math. I cannot dance. I did not grow up in any inner city or the rural South. While I was in college, I was a member of the Black Panther Party, defunct as it was, mainly because I felt I had to prove I was black enough. Some people who are described as being black by the society in which I live tell me I am not black enough. Some people whom the society calls white tell me the same thing. I've heard this mainly about my novels, from editors who have rejected me and reviewers whom I have apparently confused, and, on a couple of occasions, on a basketball court, when upon missing a shot, I muttered, EGADS! One night, at a party in New York, one of the tedious affairs where people who write mingle with people who want to write and with people who can help either group again or continue to write, a tall, thin, rather ugly book agent told me that I could sell many books if I'd forget about writing retellings of Euripides and parodies of French post-structuralists and settle down to write the true, gritty, real stories of black life. I told him that I was living a black life, far blacker than he could ever know, that I had lived one, that I would be living one. He left me to chat with an on-the-rise performance artist slash novelist who had recently posed for 17 straight hours in front of the governor's mansion on a, as a lawn jockey. He familiarly flipped one of her braided hair extensions and tossed a thumb back in my direction. The hard, gritty truth of the matter is that I hardly ever think about race. Those times when I did think about it a lot, I did so because of my guilt for not thinking about it. I don't believe in race. I believe there are people who will shoot me, or hang me, or cheat me, and try to stop me because they do believe in race, because of my brown skin, curly hair, wide nose, and slave ancestors. But that's just the way it is. For more information about Everett, and more examples of his sometimes cranky wit, follow the link at the top of this page for an interview in the Paris Review. Check back tomorrow at the link at the bottom of the screen for another episode of A Deeper Dive into African American Literature. While you're there, you'll be able to find links to all of the previous episodes in the series, as well as links to booksellers from whom you can purchase these authors' works. And please, if you've enjoyed this series so far, help us spread the word. Thanks and gratitude go out to Clifton Harkham, Jason Hunter, and Alex Jacobs Wilkie at SUNY Potsdam, as well as to David Summerstein and Bonnie North at North Country Public Radio. <laughs>